Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Game Camp webinar. Uh, today's the edition will be dedicated to the funding the dream. So topics related to investment uh, uh, topics around the gaming. Uh, we'll be talking about the VC's point in terms of investing. Uh, and uh, let's meet our uh, great speakers today. So let's meet uh, Adam McGroven, who is general partner at London Venture Partners. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Great. Uh, let's meet uh, Harry Hammer, who is associate at London Venture Partners. Hey, everyone. Uh, and then uh, Stefan Kabelgaard, who is CEO at Betadworth. Hello. Hello, Stefan. And uh, Norbert uh, Simonescu, um, industry manager from Google. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you guys for like uh, joining and uh, sharing the, your experience and knowledge with the, with, with the crowd. As always, we're encouraging everyone to join Slido. Uh, you just go to the Slido and you enter just Game Camp as the uh, name of the event. And then you can add your questions. Uh, I, 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 I'm pretty sure there will be a lot of questions to, to Ara and, and, and Harry and Stefan. Uh, and then, of course, you will be able to, to, to vote on questions of other people. So feel free to, to join uh, uh, Slido. And then, without spending uh, more time on introduction, let's invite to the stage our first uh, speakers, so, so Ara and, and Harry. And they will be talking about uh, VCs, how actually VCs evaluate and operate, and uh, how actually they look at the gaming, how they look at the companies, how they're looking at funders, and they will be sharing their uh, uh, experience and their review of, on, on working uh, with gaming and actually probably non-gaming companies and uh, how they actually look at that. Harant uh, and Ara, your, the stage is yours. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, my hope is to give you a little bit of a view into something that I guess for most people is a bit of a black box, uh, you know, the VCs and how they actually, actually evaluate and what they actually look for. Um, my own background is from game development and starting game studios, uh, but I've been doing investments for about four years. Um, in that time, I, I did a lot of panels, uh, but uh, my, my problem with the panel format is that you only get to say like four or five sentences in half an hour, so you can give no depth, and I don't feel that you're able to give any founder or uh, entrepreneur any real idea of anything. So I started working on this presentation and I hope that it answers a little bit more uh, and gives a little bit better idea of, of how to think about things. Um, I'm going to shortly introduce uh, London Venture Partners, then I'm going to go into the meat of it, which is really about how a VC operates to give you an idea of what that is like and then how we evaluate pitches. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some common mistakes or you know mistakes that we see, things that might be done better. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about funding strategy, and then um, we're going to take questions, and then we're going to talk to um, Beta Dwarf, a company that we invested in uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so London Venture Partners is a specialized games VC. It means that we only invest in gaming companies. We've been around since around 2012. We have three funds. And one of the differences between us and other venture capital companies is that we are not bankers and we are not ex-consultants. So um, I'll get back to the team in a little bit, but everyone on the team has uh, operating experience from building gaming companies, you know, building games, launching games, operating games. Um, and you know, we hope that by having that background, we are able to give you a different type of advice and maybe a bit more operational help um, and a bit more understanding of what you're going through than if we didn't have that operational experience. Um, we are a quite established VC, so we've been around a while. We're on fund three, as I said, we've done about 38 investments. And if we calculate the exit value of the companies that we have helped to, um, to give seed capital to, that has created an exit value of a bit more than $52 billion. Uh, 
Um, like I said, the team are all operating people. So starting in the corner, just going quickly through some of the people here. Uh, David Gardner, who was one of the founding partners, his startup experience was electronic arts. He joined them as employee number 11 and helped to scale it. He was the guy they sent to Europe. He set up all the offices here back in the day where there was physical distribution. So they had a distribution center in each country. And he was running global uh, studios and marketing, helped them build franchises like FIFA and saw you know, lots of uh, business models and platform transitions and, and new game design paradigms in that job. And then later led um, Atari until he then started investing. Uh, the other founding partner is David Lauke. Uh, he's a little bit more on the technical side and he founded Criterion Software which is really famous for uh, rendering heavy games like the Burnout series that I think you probably played. And they also had a middleware called Renderware. And Renderware, you know, in the 90s, if you saw Renderware when the game was booting up, you knew there would be some uh, pretty good cutscene. And then we have our finance director, Gavin Harrison, who has done lots of investment uh, project based into gaming. Um, Harry, who is with me here as an associate, and uh, uh, Rosie, and then uh, me and my background, as I said, is also on starting gaming companies. In terms of what we have been um, lucky to be part of, um, we have been part of more of the top exits than any other gaming VC out there. So five of the top 16 M&A exits of all time have been, part, uh, have been from companies that we invested in at the seed stage, like Supercell, Unity, um, Natural Motion and uh, Playfish, which I was a part of. Um, to give you some idea of like what we invest in and what what type of companies that we find interesting, um, these are four companies that we have invested in out of the 38. Um, so it's everything in the games ecosystem. It doesn't have to be games. It can be something else. So for example, Bunch um, is a company that is creating a mobile social gaming platform where you can um, connect with your friends and jump into multiplayer sessions on, on mobile. It was a company that we did, uh, we led the seed round of 2.8 million back in September 2018. And then we announced a series A of 20 million for them in September 2020. Interestingly enough, we, you can see we have lots of industry people with us on that round, uh, like Electronic Arts, Mixi, Take Two Interactive, PUBG Corporation, and so on. Um, Maybe we get to talk about that later, but it, um, it's about the strategy of you know, wh what type of capital do you bring on board? And, and for this case, it was really nice to get the validation that the industry that are operating games uh, wanted to get behind this company. Um, another one is Singularity 6. Singularity 6 is a company that we led the seed round in in May 2018. It was a 2.5 million round. Um, the team has background from Riot, and they are working on big um, PC console multiplayer games. And uh, one year later, in June 2019, we did a 16.7 million Series A uh, led by uh, Andreessen, where we followed on together with Fun Plus. Um, LA-based, um, yeah, you might have seen a little bit in the news. Another one is a mobile one, uh, but it's a mobile company is Robin Games. It's a mobile company that doesn't make what I would think of as straight games. They, they make games, but it's also a strategy of how games can grab and do things outside of gaming based on the knowledge of how to build games and operate game communities, uh, which is, I think, one of the interesting trends at the moment where we see that gaming companies are really able to conquer lots of different territory. Uh, you know, game engines are being used to make movies. Um, game-like services um, in social networking are, you know, more and more like like gamified experiences. More and more opportunities to add in e-commerce and things like that. Uh, it was a seed round in January earlier this year. Uh, we led it. Uh, it was a very large seed round of seven million. Um, and then finally, Beta Dwarf that we are going to talk to a little bit later, which is a Copenhagen-based team, a PC and console developer. Um, very fascinating team that you will get to uh, hear from. Um, very, I would say, very indie developer that when we met them, they were really thinking, okay, we've done some indie games, they've done good. Uh, is there a way for us to now kind of uh, step up and, and do something bigger? 
And we looked at it, uh, you know, in, in the same way, thinking like, wow, what these guys have been able to achieve with the type of budgets they've been working on is just mind boggling. What would happen if these guys had um, more budget? You know, we think that would be really explosive. So we, did, we led the seed round in March 2018, a 1.5 million round. And then we had a Series A about a year, a little bit more than a year later, uh, led by Makers. And then we invested again in an Everblue and, and won up a 6.7 million round. Um, so I would say, you know, one is a non-gaming, one is very much pedigree, the type of background experience that, that you might think is necessary, like, um, you know, having worked on League. Another one is a team coming out of Jam City that has um, built large mobile games before, but taking games to something new. And another one is, a, is an indie developer where the team has built everything themselves and, and don't have any experience from working at other gaming companies. So I hope that gives you some idea that it's quite broad what is possible to invest in for us. But everything is in gaming. If we think a little bit, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but if, if we think a little bit about what an, a VC does. So a VC is a business itself. Um, so it's a business that takes money from institutional investors like pension funds or very rich people. And then we make a promise to those people that we will invest their money in a certain area that we agree with them. And after 10 years, we will return that money to them with a certain amount of um, uh, return on capital. So a certain amount of interest on, on the money they, they let us use for those 10 years. Um, that's a big portion of what, a, what a, or that's the, that's the foundation. And then the operational model is that we, we basically operate in four areas. We do sourcing, which means we are out there trying to find places where it's possible to invest the money. We run some different processes to evaluate uh, what we should invest in in individual cases. There's the actual investment, which is a lot of, of uh, legal structuring and paperwork and, and uh, execution of things. And then there's the management of the investment portfolio, so giving support to the companies that we have invested in and, and helping them to raise later rounds and helping them with advice and so on. That's sort of the, the big areas that we operate in. Um, so far, we have looked at more than 3,000 opportunities that we uh, could have invested in in, in gaming. Uh, we look carefully at at least about 30 per month. Um, and to date, we at the moment, we have 23 active investments. So, so that gives you sort of a, an idea of, of the funnel. Uh, it's around like 1% of the stuff that we see that we end up um, investing in. Oops. If we um, think about how we evaluate, and I think this is where I'm going to spend the most of the time, um, this looks very, very structure, structured. And, and actually, it's not like this. Um, it's way more fluid, and it's way more uh, sort of happening in parallel. But, but I think if, as a mental model, this works quite well. Um, and I do think it starts with number one. And number one is to figure out, is there a fit? Um, and the fit means, you know, we get a pitch and we look at it and we say, is this in the market or the sector that we are investing in? So for us, it would be gaming. And then secondly, maybe there's a little bit of, of subdivision in gaming with areas we invest in and areas we don't invest in. But it's sort of a quick, like, is it a fit? And for us, it's also stage. We want to be the first institutional money into the company because we think it's really important to be uh, part of the early discussions. Um, because if, if you're like three, four guys and you set out with the right, or, or girls, and you set out on the right path with the right idea and the right product, you could be heading towards um, a very valuable company and a great workplace and so on. But if you're deviating a little bit and you pick the wrong platform, you pick VR and you're going to make your, your next um, first game in the next three years on VR, you might be headed to like a very a, a place of a lot of pain. Um, and ultimately, you end up doing some work for hire, and eventually your wife convinces you to, to take a job somewhere else. So uh, the stage is always very important. And that's why you always have to look at the VCs that you're going to contact to make sure that you're talking to the right VCs based on the stage you're at. Our stage is called pre-seed or seed. It means we invest when there is uh, only a PowerPoint presentation and the company hasn't been established yet, or the company has been established, but you haven't been out raising any meaningful money. You might have a bit of friends and family money, but you haven't been out raising 
uh, money from um, uh, institutional investors. So typically your company is valued around, let's say three to 5 million. It could be up to um, 10 or 15 in, in some cases. And then we look at the ambition. We try to think, you know, what are you trying to build? Are you trying to build a big business that will be remembered and loved by lots of players around the, around the world or, or lots of customers? Or are you trying to build just a small thing for you and your friends? Uh, VCs need to invest in things that have sufficient ambition uh, because of that model where we take the money from, from uh, rich individuals or pension funds and we promise to generate a certain amount of return to them. So this is a pretty quick one. If, if this is a fit, then, you know, then we are kind of starting to look at it. And I would say that we start looking at the market opportunity point. Um, all VCs tell you that um, they invest in team first and foremost. Um, but so far, I don't think that it's actually true. I think team is extremely important. But I think if the market opportunity that you're pitching, even if you're a brilliant team, you will you won't really find um, people who want to invest in you. If your thesis is a little bit off, if it's a little bit weak and, and people maybe look at it and think, well, you know, you will learn and you'll need to evaluate and you'll need to pivot a little bit and the team is amazing, then maybe you can get investment. But, but it, your opportunity has to be within some reasonable realm of, of interesting, no matter how strong your team is. That's why I like to structure it this way uh, and, and present it this way. So the first thing is really this thesis. What are you proposing, proposing to do? And it could be that you're pitching something where there's a thesis fit, which means that we've already looked at that area, we've already thought about it, we're already exciting about it, excited about it, and we already hope to find someone who wants to do something in this area. But it could also be that it's something brand new that we've never thought about, and, and we're just struck by how brilliant your idea is. Then we start looking at what are your insights and your model? How do you think about the gaming landscape? How do you think about the market? Do you have a dynamic model in your head? Do you understand that these are like lots of moving actors? There are distribution points, there are customers, there are, there's competition, there's evolution, there's technology that enables new things. Uh, your player base is learning and, and adopting and getting used to certain things. So I would say, a strong pitch is based on a strong dynamic model where you can demonstrate that at least in your area, you understand how this is kind of moving and it has a certain direction and your company plugs into that direction in an interesting way. Then we look for leverage opportunities, which is, are you hooking on to certain opportunities that could give you an unfair advantage to kind of catapult into the market? So some obvious ones are like, um, a new console launch cycle. If you could be one of the launch games, it would give you a lot of marketing. If you were early on on Nintendo Switch, you know you would be one of the few games in the store, and you would get lots of attention. Th those type of leverage opportunities can be really important to catapult your company um, into existence. And then there are others that are more maybe um, less obvious, but but still obvious, like. Uh, uh, for example, if you have an AI strategy and you start building out AI capabilities to do your QA, and then over time, maybe that tool itself becomes really valuable. And even if your game is only doing so-so, you built this additional valuable piece of tech that, uh, that uh, drives the value of your company in addition to the revenue of your games. Then we look a little bit at the competitive advantage. And, and that's also, yeah, it's a, it's a long discussion. Some, some, a lot of VCs feel that we, we overrate that, that uh, competitive advantage point sometimes. And, and sometimes you feel that a business isn't actually going to be uh, maintaining a sustainable competitive, competitive advantage over time, but you maybe put too much emphasis on it. It means, can you, is the thing that you are innovating something that you will be able to benefit from more than others? Or are you just introducing a new feature or, or, or method to the market and everyone else will just instantly copy it and, and you're left with no advantage. Um, and then if there are data points and you've collected data points or if there's traction or anything like that, we would look at that. So that's kind of the market bit. We'll, we'll look at all those different things. Then on the team side, we will look at your background and your track record. Um, it can be both uh, positive and negative. Uh, people tend to think that you, you that background in gaming is only positive. 
and that VCs tend to only invest really in people who have a lot of experience. Uh, it's not actually true because sometimes you want that um, newness. You want someone who hasn't worked at a big incumbent company who sees the world differently and is maybe more in tune with the world as it's about to become than the world as it was. And sometimes you find with people that have worked in big incumbent companies, the thesis they present can sometimes be a little bit more of an anti-thesis than a thesis. It's, it's a, sometimes a little bit more like they say, the company I used to work at did this mistake and they always did that mistake and they used to kill games before they were released but very late so we are never going to do any of these things so their thesis is like very reactive to a company that is already an incumbent instead of being focused on what is a great opportunity in the market so so the background and, and experience is um, both good and bad um yeah many people ask about that that's why i wanted to elaborate a little bit then we look at the team composition. What is the required domain knowledge? Do you have that in your team? Uh, you know, different type of businesses built at different points in time require different teams. Uh, you know, if it's very early on a new platform, you, it might be okay to have a bit more thin team and, and add people as you go. Maybe it's more depending on just getting product out and learning. Maybe in a more competitive later stage uh, environment, uh, the, the cost of learning is so high that you kind of can't afford to learn on the job and you need a more complete team. You know, if your game costs 20 million, you can't have a plan that says that you plan to fail on the first game, and but you'll learn something and then you plan to fail on your second game, but learn something. And then hopefully by the third game, you have the knowledge required. required. You, you might need to have that knowledge to do your first attempt. Um, and then we look at entrepreneurial fit. You know, are you and your team people who are capable of wearing many hats um, and, and juggle lots of, of things and, and work with limited resources and, and work with limited control of things? You know, typically a lot of people who are just helping you in an outsourced fashion and so on. Or are you someone who needs a big organization behind you and so on? And then what's the nature of your drive and commitment? Have you, have, do you think you've just find a way to print money and that's what you're going to do? Or do you genuinely have an idea of a product that you think the market and the users will be uh, delighted, delighted to, to um, experience? Because to build a really good business, you need a more genuine drive than just the desire to make money. Uh, and finally, a very important point is moral and integrity versus all stakeholders. Because we will look at you as and evaluate, can you build a company and team culture that would allow you to build a world-class team? Or are you someone who maybe is a bit lacking in integrity and people will sense it and good people won't join your team and, and there will be conflicts and so on. So moral and integrity is really, really important. Um, then we look at product. Um, we look a bit at your general approach. We look at... Uh, how are you developing? Do you validate quickly? Um, and then we look at what's your user understanding. I think great teams have great understanding of who uh, their customers are and why the customers would like the product that they're making. No, no really, we have a Sorry, question. Right. No, yeah. sort of Thank question. you for all this insight, Ara yeah. and Harry. And uh, let me just uh, jump in with a, a short question. Um, uh, we are working as well with, with many founders, entrepreneurs, and uh, you probably have a, a much broader view here from, from a VC perspective on what is good founders, good uh, entrepreneur material. Uh, is there something uh, you, you could pinpoint here what, what you are uh, specifically looking at when, when discussing with, with the founding team, with the, the, the members of, of the founding team? And, and if you can tell us uh, a bit from your perspective and, and experience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think first I want to say that we don't have a pattern. So I, I see that sometimes people are wondering if there's a pattern, like a almost like a persona that we have and you must match this, otherwise we wouldn't give you money. And that's not true at all. Um, but I think the key thing is, um, if you have sort of entrepreneurial drive, um, so are you driven by getting to results quickly? Are you, do you have the right mix of vision and 
curiosity and ability to take on board feedback. Um, so when you go in, like, like a really good entrepreneur goes into a lot of dialogue and connect, is very happy to connect with a lot of people to validate lots of different things. But at the same time, it's not a person that tries to please everyone. That you know, it's a person that can maintain its vision, but can also question and, and bring on board and realize like, wow, all these people have been asking about that thing. I should look into that. Maybe there's something there that I don't see or that I should modify. Um, VCs sometimes call it coachable, but I don't really like the word because it sounds like the VC is sitting above and, and you're sort of training someone lesser. Um, but, but I think the meaning of coachable is can you have those constructive dialogues where you feel there's interesting give and take? So if we feel that the founder would never ever listen to us or anyone else, he's just gonna run ahead no matter what happens and never will take on board anything, we, we won't invest. It's just not a place where we could add value. But also like the other extreme, like I said, if it's someone where we feel that, and I've had this sometimes, you, you give feedback and then they ask to repitch a week later and they've redone the game and you realize that they, they've actually taken you to be the game designer. And that's also really, really scary and we would never invest because you have to be able to hold on to your vision and, and just take on board what you what what you can fit with your vision. Is it okay to fail? Uh, how how uh, would you look at, uh, at at those who were maybe or are in your portfolio? Uh, the numbers you presented at the beginning are obviously impressive. And, and I, I keep asking myself as well, um, is uh, the way you deal with the failure and the capability of dealing with the failure one element which can make a good uh, or a successful uh, founder? Can you can you tell us a bit more about the failures? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, uh, yeah, it's two levels to my answer, I guess. So so, so one is that I think as a as a CEO and founder you have to be very willing to admit or identify weakness in yourself and your team and your product. So if you are a person that needs to get positive feedback and, and, and reinforcement all the time, you're probably in a weak place and you probably need to back yourself up with someone else. Because I think the ability to look negatively at what you've done and constantly think, how could this have been done better? is really the driving force of getting somewhere good. Uh, so you have to be able to do that. You have to look at everything and realize like, no matter how good that was, there are areas where we could have done much better. And you know, we have to improve on those areas. And as, as the founder CEO, your job is really to identify those areas of weakness in your org, or looking down the road to think, when we take this next step, we are going to fall short on this and this and this. We master it today at our level, but the level we need to step into, the scale we need to step into, we're not going to be able to manage it. And look around the world and see people and, and, and be willing to admit people who are doing things better than you're doing. Um, unlike outright failure, I think the key is um, what did you learn? So. Uh, sometimes you get teams that pitch and you ask them, okay, so when your last job it failed, why did it fail? And I would say way too often people give you answers that are not reassuring. They will tell you things like, you know, you talk to a team that tried to do a startup in, in mid-core um, mobile games in the last three years and they failed. And you ask, so what's your takeaway? You know, what happened and so on. And then they will say maybe things like, well, it's really difficult to get users. Uh, CPI is really, really high. It's really difficult to, to get the right monetization system. And it's like, it's just not good enough. You know, it's like if you've spent five million to learn that, I mean, seriously, you know, I could have introduced you to a range of people that you could have met at Starbucks and they would have told you those things for free, right? So you have to be more, you know, you have to, you have to accept that if you spend 5 million learning, you should have learned something, you know, you, something really profound. Um, so, th so that's the thing, I think, if there's nothing wrong and it can be really positive to have failed at something and it can make you like correctly humble and correctly paranoid and, and correctly focus on like validating early and all these things, right? So, but, but then you have to learn something. So if you have failure in your past and you try to pitch something to a VC, I think 
be profound and try to spend some real time thinking about what you learned and how that will impact what you're pitching and how you're going to do it next time. Also, just to jump in, I think the best way to deal with failure, at least if you've had it in your your past, is to own it, own the narrative. Um, I've I've seen a couple of examples where people have yeah. tried to blame other people and push it on to everyone else. And I think part of being a CEO and a founder is saying, um, especially at the early stage, that this company is built on on people. Um, and therefore, it's it's the level of integrity that you have as a person that we are looking for. And moving forward into the future, and this is to Ari's point, that we expect the first game or the first product to fail. Um, and then the, by all probability, the company itself will liquidate. So you've got to go into startup life ex expecting that and thinking, OK, what, what have I learned? What will be the cost of failure? Um, both in terms of time, uh, money, and also people. And then what will I learn from it? If this doesn't work, will I be able to adjust and pivot? And uh, I think this also goes to the point of what we're looking for in a team, that their adaptability um, to circumstances. And, and also replying to, I think, Maria's question. Uh, hello, Maria. Uh, we have, I think, across the portfolio, this is funds one to three, around 600, 700 employees. In the company's overall, so that's an average of around thirty-ish. I, I don't have specific figures to to mind. If you're talking about companies that we're looking at uh, at the moment, it's probably averaging two to five uh, f uh, people within that. So maybe you've got a couple of founders and early employees. I don't think we we tend to invest into any more than a, a team of ten because then that tends to be a bit later stage, higher burn. Uh, usually, they've got a product out Why in the market. Why we talk about product in the interest of time? Uh, thank you very much for these answers. And uh, uh, keep uh, sending us the answers on, on uh, Slido. So just let's move to the product right now, which yeah. is equally important, if not even more important. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and actually, to, uh, I'm going to frame it a little bit in, in, uh, in line of your questions. Um, because it also links to failure in a way. And I, I think one of the characteristics of a founder is that you are willing to kill things, meaning that you are willing to admit failure and you're working in a scientific way towards success, meaning that when the metrics show you that this game is not on the track to be uh, the type of success that you need, then you either have the plan that you have thought through how to get this to become a meaning the, the right level of meaningful product for you, or you move off it. So if you have a fail story and you tell me, for example, that you worked on something and uh, you knew after a year that it wasn't going to be successful, and then you spent two more years working on it, that's that would sort of, in my book, mark you down as not the type of caliber to build a business because you would have to, you know, much quicker get to that conclusion and 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 if it's true what you're saying that you kind of knew it early but you kept working on it for years you know that would be horrible right um and i see that very often in teams uh, you see people especially in mobile you see people launching something and the metrics are really bad and then uh, they have a plan for what they're working on but if you sit down with the team and you take what they're working on and you get them to estimate what each uh, uh, each change is going to lead to in terms of changes to retention or monetization and then you plan it out and then you calculate what that will mean what will this game be like in terms of monetization and retention and then you can see that it's it's not even close to what they would need to be successful then often even then they are not willing to kill that game and, and move on to a different idea so so this desire to just keep going is very strong so on, on product, you know, that those are some of the things we want to see. We want to see from your past. We want to see from, from your plan that you're, you have a general approach where you are searching, you're validating, right? You want to validate things as early as possible. Um, I think in game development, you can validate things earlier than almost anyone thinks you can do. 
Um, the, the best game I ever made, we validated with the, with the target audience after one week of work. We had a bullet point list, we brought in people in a focus group, and we spent the weekend discussing how we thought about this genre, where we wanted to innovate, what we found to be a pain in this genre and wanted to drop and so on. And we got lots of interesting feedback and lots of confidence around our plans and so on. So validation is like a super important thing. It's like, you know, how do you search your way as scientifically as possible? And then again, user understanding, monetization plans and early design documents, high level dev and milestone plans and so on, and validation again, community plans. I think the one thing that every game VC will be feeling is that no matter what your plan is, your plan will be wrong. Um, only the community can sort of help you to get that plan on track. Um, so you have to be visionary. You, you have to have a vision for what you're going to develop. Your, your community cannot come with the vision, but you know you have to get that vision into something so you can start working with the community as quickly as possible and then reallocating resources. While, while we are uh, at this point, there is another question asking you, let's say, if, if we are building uh, a pretty massive game, an MMO, a multiplayer, yep. is it better to raise money at the beginning as, as a seed, uh, with a seed round or pre-seed round, or release an MVP and, uh, and raise more money later on? I'll get back to that in a little bit, I think. I think it's better to answer it uh, on funding strategy. Um, but again, and then uh, so, so we look at those things, and and the way this is supposed to work is that, um, in my in my view, the way it's supposed to work is that we should evaluate your pitch based on uh, the vision, which means your market opportunity that you present. Like this is how we see the future, and the team that is going to execute on this um, this vision and this strategy, and then in the perfect way, your product becomes a case study for me. It's like okay, you've told me this brilliant thing about the future of, of uh, viewing games and Twitch and, and next generation Twitch and Stadia. And it's just brilliant. You're, you're, I think you're absolutely onto something. And the way you're talking about free to play next, next generation to add more value in free to play, blah, blah, blah. It all sounds like, wow, wonderful. And then the product becomes a way for me to see, based on this brilliant strategy, how do you kind of cut products from that strategy? Thinking that you know, you're going to make multiple games that are going to gradually move you towards becoming that Activision of the future or the next gen EA or whatever, right? Based on that strategy with, with probably multiple products. So your product becomes this way to see, do you are you consistently in an interesting way able to break down that market opportunity you see into product that are scoped in an interesting way based on team size, risk, time to market, and all these things. Um, but in most cases, in most pitches, um, the focus on the single product becomes much more than that. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that later. And then I would say at the last point, it sounds maybe strange, but but as a last point, I think we we look at the financial opportunity, and by that I mean your budgets, your your capital requirements, your uh, hypothetical exits, and so on, because those are typically in certain ranges that don't really vary so much. We sort of know them. We sort of know what this type of company could be worth. We sort of know what type of capital you typically kind of need. There's a certain amount of variability, but it's sort of like not something you spend a lot of time on unless the rest uh, works out. And um, on the budget side, we don't spend a lot of time on it. For a seed stage company, your budgets are going to deviate quite a lot anyway. The budgets are more interesting for us to see how do you think about scaling? Like, you know, do you go out on day one and hire lots of people, or do you have a more nimble approach where you validate something before you make lots of hires and so on? So, those are kind of the evaluation factors. Uh, I'll move on, but you can ask me questions to them later, of course. Um, oops. Then some of the common issues, uh, I'll have to rush a little bit now, but some of the common issues that we see in the pitches that we get, um, I would say one big one that I get a lot in Scandinavia and uh, Germany, I'm based in Berlin, is what I call a lifestyle business. So it's the digital mom and pop version, um, or store version in a digital form, where basically there just isn't enough revenue potential. So these are either models where simply there isn't enough revenue, or it is that you as a founder are not comfortable to forecast things and you are uncomfortable with, with knowing how to use resources um, 
to, to, to drive revenue. So typically, you know, a lot of companies will pitch us things that says if everything works out beautifully, then in five years they will make five million um, euro or dollar revenue. And uh, you know, and if really that is the plan, then then you know, then it is just not VC fundable. Um, another big one is what I call another game company. It's pretty self-explanatory. It just means that this is something that has been done lots of times before. So if you're successful, then you are one more company doing this. Your company might be worth a little bit, but by the fact that this has been done so many times before, your case is a little bit arrogant almost because it means that you are saying that the others don't know how to do it, so you're going to do it better than them. Uh, and it's not hinging upon any new tech or any new opportunity or something. You're just basically going to manage and, and be better at creative than anyone out there. Um, and it's limited how many exit opportunities you get for a business like that typically because the number of buyers is much lower if there are lots of companies that have already done the same thing as you're planning to do. Um, a big category is what I call a publisher pitch which is that you are pitching to us as a VC or other VCs, but your pitch is about a game. So a VC, does, a VC cares about your game, but we care more about your business. And there's lots of reasons why that is the case. And one of them is that you know, everyone that works in the gaming industry for a while has a game that they would love to make and a game they think should be made. But the knowledge of coming up with a brilliant plan for a new gaming company brand is a very much more rare resource. And the process of coming up with this kind of dynamic model of, of you know, what the future looks like and, and, and what Activision would look like if it was created today is a much more demanding exercise than to come up with a design for a single game. So typically, you don't want to pitch a single game to a VC. You want to show a VC that you know that they are interested in investing in a company and you have a great plan for a company, not just for a game. Another one is what I call exit aversion, which is a, I think is a misunderstanding. It's a, a lot of people that look at me and say, are you one of those VCs that want an exit? And then it's it sounds like a dirty word. And I think they get an idea in their head that it means we're going to be putting lipstick on a pig and, and try to sell it off before everyone realizes that it's, an, it's, it's a stinking, uh, awful business that will collapse uh, the second anyone looks at it. Um, it you know actually it's the opposite. Uh, if you want to make something that is purchasable by one of the leading companies in the world, you typically have to build a much more solid business where things can run even if you leave or if you're on holiday for a long time. People get paid on time. You have trademarked your uh, uh, your game names. You've registered things. You have proper labor contracts in place. <clears throat> you have proper training systems. Proper HR. Uh, you know, you have a proper business that is properly structured and, and it's a solid ongoing thing that is likely to be able to last uh, for the long term. So it's a more expensive business to build, whereas the opposite is often, you know, something that is purely founder driven and a lot of the knowledge and, and legal issues exist only in the founder's head. And the second he leaves, it, it sort of crumbles behind him. Uh, it also doesn't mean uh, that the founders have to sell all their stock. It just means you have to work towards a point in time where there's a bigger transaction that allows those that want to get out, at least your, your um, financial investors, to cash in their shares to, um, uh, to cash at some high or market-like price. Um, and you also have to think about the fact that if you are giving your employees stock options and you're not working towards an exit, then uh, you're doing them a quite, quite a disservice and, and you've kind of lied to them. So I call that exit aversion. And the last issue I see is what I call scaling incompetence, which links a little bit to the first one. And that's where people show me that 5 million revenue forecast. And I tell them, so imagine that you had more resources and imagine that you had a bigger team or whatever it is that you need. Do you picture that you could scale this business to a bigger business? And then they look at me and they think, oh, you're one of those VCs. You want to see that stupid hockey stick thing that I've read about. OK, they think if you're like that, I'll make that graph. You know, it doesn't cost me anything. But the point is that it's not about just making that graph. It is like, do you have the experience and the understanding of how you can deploy resources to increase the revenue possibility or opportunity for a product by porting it to more, uh, more devices, more platforms, by doing better 
regional geographic support by adding in more features by adding in multiplayer by making a co-op feature by improving the amount of content you know there are lots of ways uh, that you can you can drive the revenue on, on lots of different businesses the question is do you know how to do it so a VC does not ask this question because we want you to just make a graph that is meaningless, but we want to see how are you thinking about scaling to a large scale business. Um, another thing that we uh, work on a lot, th this is kind of shifting a bit if you remember my agenda. So this is something that we work on a lot and something that you should be thinking about if you're thinking to pitch. And this is what we call funding strategy which I think we can break down roughly into uh, race timing, the pitch itself, the capital source, and the execution. So the race timing is trying to find out the right balance between dilution and risk. So how much money do you raise when? Uh, because the earlier you raise it, the more likely it is that your, your stock is worth very little. So you have to give away much, very much of your business for a small amounts of capital. Uh, and if you could build your business and you could get revenue and you could get traction and you could show that you are successful, then your stock is worth a lot. And now you can sort of suddenly, for a small portion of your business, for very little dilution, you can get in big chunks of capital. But of course, if you take it to the extreme, your risk will be very, very high. Because if you, if you bank that one game is going to do everything and you're going to run out of money unless that game pays for your whole business then suddenly if it fails you could find yourself in a very bad position where you only have a couple of months left of, of runway of, of cash on the bank account and now you have to go out and fundraise and it will be um, pretty bad so then it might be better to raise a little bit more money up front uh, a typical thing here is that i find that most vcs will tell you as a game startup that the way you should do things is this is back to the MMO question, that you should uh, raise a small amount of money to just set up your team and build some kind of like very cheap vertical slice. And then you should go out with that vertical slice and you should show it to investors and then they will give you the money to finish your game. And it's definitely a strategy, but I think in very, very, very many cases, that is not a good strategy. Um, I think for most VCs who don't have experience from game development, if you ask them to sit down with you and play a white box buggy thing and you're going to stand over their shoulder and tell them like, OK, don't look at this now. Yeah, yeah. You know, remember that this is white box. And now imagine that there was an enemy here, you know, and that, that he was like really well balanced and that you had like a secondary ability. And then, you know, oh, and always remember that this would be co-op. So imagine your friends are next to you right now. You know, you're trying to tell him all these different things, how cool this thing is going to be. But what they see it's not something they've seen before. It's a weird sort of white box thing that looks pretty crappy, and they're wondering if you even know how to make games. So that can be a much more difficult sell than to sell, for example, a vision that is crafted really well, where you are able to tell them that you have seen the future of the gaming business, and you know how a certain space is going to be, and you know what company you need to build to own that space. So. Um, those are the type of things that you need to think about in funding strategy around race timing and sizes and so on. Uh, and then that links also what I just said now to, to pitch. Do you sell hope or do you sell expectation? Hope is a dream. Expectation is like based on something you think something is about to happen. So expectation would be you're racing on metrics, which is the typical mobile thing. You know, release your game, get soft launch metrics, and then try to try to raise money on it. Very, very difficult because most metrics are not going to be great. So the investor is going to look at it and think, nah, I don't want to put money into that. It, it doesn't look good. So it's kind of like only when you don't need money, when your metrics are so good that you don't need money, is the case where you could probably raise money on metrics consistently. Uh, so you have to think about those things. You have to think about vision versus playable. You have to think about your company and what is the traction and what's the story that you will be able to tell about your company at the time you've chosen to raise money. Then you have to think about capital source. Um, where are you? Where and what type of money are you going to get? You know, there are grants from governments. There's strategic money from other gaming companies. There are financial investors like us. There are angel investors. Then there is what's called non-dilutive funding. Like you could do maybe a deal with some, like Epic, uh, to to launch on their store, uh, and they will give you some cash, and they don't take shares for it. 
you know, there are publishing contracts, maybe you could sign off the rights for China and get some cash for that. And then you have the whole debate of what is called smart money, which means uh, uh, investors that know the area that you are building product for and know a bit about those products and could help you and give you advice on how to build those products versus the ones that will not and will keep asking you in the board meetings, tell me again how it is that you make money when the game is free. Um, and then, you know, there are leads and followers and you need to think about, you know, are you first going out to get a lead or are you first talking to followers because you will need a lead to get the follower to invest and so on. And then there's the whole execution bit, which is a little bit of a black, um, black box and a little bit kind of magic thing. Uh, it's a little bit weird and most people don't get to experience it very many times. But you, you may you may have heard of this word FOMO, which means fear of missing out. And very much of it is about FOMO. Investors don't generally want to invest because it implies risk and they, they might lose the money and look stupid. So they generally need some kind of nudging to want to put their money at risk, which is typically called FOMO. They need to feel like, shit, you know, I got to do this. Like these other guys are putting money in here. If I don't react quickly, maybe I can't even invest money in here. You know, all these other guys are seeing something. I don't see it, but you know, they see it. So I need to put my money in. An enormous amount of the investors operate like this. And it can be, it's really necessary to create some kind of pressure to get people to, decide to start offering you their money. Um, yeah, we can talk about more on this if you have questions. Then uh, last slide, I believe, um, bonus slide. Um, this is something that is a little bit weird to me, like very few of the companies that we ever uh, talk with ever do this. They, none of them ever ask us questions. Uh, you know, you always have this like moment at the end of the meeting where you ask the, the, the other party, so do you have any questions for us? And most companies can come up with like one question, but it's not an interesting one and it's not something they've thought about. And they never ask about things like this. So uh, one of the people I respect the most in the gaming business, he says that you should think of the fundraising when you are a startup, you should think about it like hiring. You are hiring your board members. There's so much money out there that you shouldn't so you still shouldn't mainly focus on the money bit. You should focus on like who is the person that comes with the money that you're going to have to relate to, that's going to sit on your board, that's going to give you advice, that's going to be disruptive or helpful depending on. And you need to ask questions. So you need to ask some stuff like wh what do they know? What do they play? Do they even play games? Have they built or worked or invested in successful gaming companies before? What's the status of these companies now? Are they still around or did they collapse right away? Did those companies ever deliver hits? Did they do repeat hits? Like, like interview, figure out who is this person? What knowledge do they really have? And then ask what some of the VC language stuff is. For example, we have a word called graduation rate, which means the percentage of companies that we invested in seed that later are able to raise a series a it's called the graduation rate and you should ask like what is their graduation rate because it's a good like ratio of knowing are they really good at guiding you to build the right pitch and the right funding strategy to be able to get that series a right because if they give you a million but they can't they, they've never helped any company or very few companies they invest in are successful at, at getting that 10 million then you're never going to make your game if if your game costs more than a million um and, and then ask, you know, like if, if your plan means you need to raise 10 million next time in Series A, what have they done in the past? What is the typical Series A that they help to raise? And what do they do? Do they lead Series A? Do they take part in Series A? If they don't take part in Series A, then your Series A investors are going to look at it like, that doesn't look good. You know, your investor that invested in C, they don't believe in you much, right? They're not even putting any money into your Series A. And then ask about what kind of support, you know, what are they doing for you? What what other companies have they invested in? So so please, you know, like spend time on this. And, and the good thing about this is that, number one, you need to do it because you need to figure out, like, who is this guy that you're about to include in your team and give lots of power to, to influence your thinking and focus and so on. And secondly is that it sort of turns the tables a little bit so you don't become... You know this guy with with your we say in Norwegian uh, your hat in your hand you know kind of sitting there like please give me some money and and you become a bit more equal you start pushing back like I have some demands I'm not going to take anyone's money you know like you need to impress me a little bit with your knowledge uh, before I'm going to choose to go with you uh, 
And I think it's really important because right now you should know that there's so much money that wants to be invested in gaming that if you cannot get anyone to show interest in putting money into your business, then very likely your pitch is pretty awful and you should consider thinking through that pitch and thinking that maybe there's something wrong. Maybe you should re reconsider that pitch. You should at least be able to get money. If your pitch is good, you should be able to get good people who have good track record to help you. But if you really can't get any money, then uh, I would probably advise you to, to rethink your whole um, business plan. That was it. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave the floor for Stefan. Or do we do questions now? Thank you. Thank you, Aaron Harry, for for great presentation. Maybe before we go to the uh, Stefan presentation, uh, I will ask you, uh, like from your experience, uh, what is actually, you know, the, is there any, like, you know, the best uh, time point to, to start discussing with VC or like uh, do it like as early as possible? Or like, do you see like many people doing that too late, too early? What is your experience on that? I personally like it as early as possible. I like it before there's like a super polished deck and uh, you've talked to lots of other VCs because it gives a possibility to sort of go a bit back and forth and learn to know each other a little bit and so on. And uh, uh, it's more comfortable for everyone if you have more time because then you can build a bit of a relationship. You can, you know, get to know each other a little bit and so on. So I yeah. think... Uh, from our point of view, it's like as early as possible that some of the investments I'm most happy would have been before the founders have established a legal entity. So they are just out sort of testing an early version of their deck. Uh, many teams I'm talking to right now don't have a deck. Mm -hmm. They are working on putting together a deck and then they can use me. So they use me to sort of like show them like what, what does a good deck look like? How do VCs think? And you know, then I have to give them all this like value and they sort of get to test me, right? Um, so both parties can evaluate each other. I think it's a good one. And I, I, I think it's a good signal if you go almost a bit earlier than what you might expect, because mm -hmm. then you can work out, are they just using me for a transactional relationship or do they, are they generally wanting to help me out? Are they altruistic to founders or do they want to extract? Um, on the other hand, I think everything depends on which kind of investor you're you're mm -hmm. speaking to so uh it's a signal of competency that you know the particular stage that um uh, an investor is looking for uh, what their investment thesis is around the sector so don't be surprised if you're pitching a very early stage content company to a series a b investor that only invests into the infrastructure layer of gaming um that it won't necessarily be a, a successful meeting so uh and then just I guess general advice for honing pitches uh, just, just try and circulate and oxygenate it as much as you can pitching your idea to people you trust preferably somebody who's raised VC or as an investor themselves so you can break that mum test that uh, your mum would say of course it's a, a wonderful idea darling um, go and do that but just getting hard feedback early on so you're not wasting months of, of time and then also of course reference check the, the VC if you can beforehand or during but as I understand, it's more like conversations, not like uh, because I I when sometimes I'm I'm talking with some potential founders and I'm like you know discussing with them like different opportunities for like uh, for getting investment and getting uh, financing for the for the projects. At least, for example, in the Sea region, I I hear very often that expression. You know, actually, you know, I'm working on that idea on this deck right now. I will polish that to to the to the very last word because I have just only one chance. Uh, to you know to get the attention of the investor for like you know two minutes and then uh, uh, that that two minutes will decide about everything so okay i will work like really hardly for the next weeks and months till i will polish that to the to the last uh, slide I, I, again i think that speaks more to the investor rather than the pitch itself um we, we're very happy when it's fairly raw because then we can talk through their assumptions mm -hmm. um, and we can work more closely with them because that's actually, I mean, what LVP is. We we are operators and we like to get in and get our hands dirty talking about the product idea and company vision. So if you can be open and honest about that conversation, then it, it bodes well for the, our future relationship. Yeah. And I think also it talks back to like, what is a good entrepreneur? And I think a good entrepreneur is someone who's out there 
networking a lot, talking to people. And the best entrepreneurs they have, when we talk to them, even if it's super early, they've already been talking to companies that we have invested in recently, that have maybe have raised big Series A's. They've pitched uh, their early versions of their pitch to these same guys. You know, mm -hmm. they've been out there, they're testing, and they see us as, as part of that of sort of, of having some early conversations and, and so on. But then but then actually when, when you then look later stage, I think when you start looking at series A, uh, I think you should be quite prepared. You know, then it's quite different. Then, it, then it's a business that's pitching. It's not a, a conversation with an entrepreneur. It's a business and the business needs to show off how professional the organization is and you need to be really polished. And I see more times on series A that people go out too early and they should rather have spent another month polishing the vision and made it really, really interesting, but they have this urgency to like spend minimum time on it and just want to raise, you know? Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. This preparation is not only on working on the deck, but like preparation, like understanding the, the like background, who you're talking to, uh, references, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, uh, of course, uh, like the guys will stay as, with us, like for discussion. Uh, but now uh, let's 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 go to the next presentation from Stefan, who actually is the company that the guys invested in, uh, and uh, he will actually share his 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 experience and actually his view on uh, on this investment. Yeah, what what really changed? What what was the same? How actually? What kind of you know? Uh, uh differences he saw from like taking money and how actually he even was asking for that money stefan the the stage is yours i guess i should unmute myself so am i loud and clear now yes great so uh yes exactly what you said i think part of it is covered in q a but uh i will definitely cover part of it as well in the in the slides so let's just jump to it i guess i'm a little bit time pressured now but uh Let's see what I can do. Uh, so bit it off uh, real quickly about us. We are located in Denmark, Copenhagen, Scandinavia, uh, basically. And we are currently 32 full-time employees. If you count uh, interns and, and contractors and so on, uh, we are, we are uh, just below 40. Uh, we've raised a total amount of money of 8.1 million. And uh, our mission is described as friendshiping the world with co-op games. Um, you could also say that uh, what we want to do is find the key to accelerate a friendship really quick between two strangers or people who are not that intimate in a friendship yet. We want to accelerate that as well. Last time we kind of tried to describe this, for instance, in our series A, we, we described ourselves with this little uh, blurb, which I thought might be interesting, uh, but that is that we are evolving co-op from our debut title, which was co-op, uh, to the number one strategy MOBA on Steam, which is our uh, one of our current games. Uh, and in the process, we uh, outsized some AAA communities uh, with how we built them. Uh, and we can go into depth with that, but it's not currently part of, of the plan to talk about it. Uh, the past titles we've done is our debut game, Forced. Uh, it was a premium game. It sold more than half a million units, which isn't insane, but it, it allowed us to uh, to continue without being uh, reliant on anybody else. We could fund the next title, which we did, Forced Showdown. Uh, you could consider that, uh, as, as I said, one of our least successful games that we learned a lot from. and. Uh, was a catalyzator for us focusing on the community building that we've then achieved with uh, Minion Masters, uh, which I would say one of the cool things this uh, has achieved is, uh, is, for instance, a Discord server that is only the a fifth of the size of Fortnite's uh, and has been uh, doing well for us. Um, but a lot of the capital we've raised is for our fourth game, which is really the, uh, the the peak of what we want to achieve with our trajectory of specializing in mobile-like games, and uh, and it's especially the one that uh, where the, the vision is resharpened and is focusing on the acceleration of friendshiping, um, and that's that's what we are very much doing now. These two current titles. 
And I'd like to emphasize that we are maybe, I mean, I think every startup is probably unique. I, you could even, uh, I guess, criticize the idea that we are a startup, but if we define it as somebody that uh, that's not necessarily 100% sure of uh, of what the business is that they're doing, and, and it's not a, yet in, in ultimate growth state, we would still be that. But we've been around for quite a while, uh, like nine years ago, uh, as this picture shows, we were sleeping in a classroom, we were still students and we were uh, we had basically found this deserted classroom and lived there illegally for almost a year until we were discovered and this was the our bootstrapping this uh, method to to uh, have very low costs and uh, and then basically focus on creating uh, our first product uh, we had imagined it would take only half a year and we did that five times in a row until it took us three years um, but it did lead us to uh, to, to basically uh, fund the company in that way. Because when we had lived there for a year, uh, we were thrown out, discovered one day and, and thrown out. Uh, and in the process, we had saved up some, some money because we had paid zero rent, of course. Uh, and then we put that into a co-rented house and finished uh, the game uh, almost from there, doing some Kickstarters and things like that. And then made our first game without um, getting cash from neither publishers or VCs. Um, so far. So that means that we were kind of like slow bootstrapped, isolated game company that didn't didn't have access to a lot of others uh, to talk with. I, I, maybe others can recognize this, but uh, but back then there was very few jobs in Denmark that was uh, games oriented and really wanted to do this. So our main main approach to that would be to, to build our own company. And, and that's kind of what we started out with. Uh, Additionally, we, we, when we started raising, for instance, uh, for, for VC money, we had been profitable for some years, which is probably non-traditional for, for startups. Um, and one of the key things I'm really happy about what, what VCs uh, did to us uh, was, uh, and I guess especially the LVP, because they were the main or the only seed investor we had. And they really took us out of the isolation and uh, accelerated our learning immensely. I, I, I'd say I'm a pretty outward CEO, so I do network a lot, but getting suddenly access to then uh, constantly ask, ask for uh, introductions and so on, like uh, like LVP provided, uh, accelerated that exponentially in, in versus what I was able to get before that. If you want to check out our founding story, which has become a little bit of uh, a famous thing on Imgur, you can, you can check the link here below. Um, and oops. And then uh, read it all. It's like a cartoon uh, that you can check. Um, so yeah, I think uh, one worry that especially we had also because we had heard we we weren't too familiar with VCs uh, in Denmark, and uh, I think we were actually the first company almost to attract uh, cash or, or even a VC investment uh, outside of Denmark. And and gaming VCs, for instance, is close to non-existent in, in Denmark. Uh, so it's just not a big part of what you think about as a traditional Danish studio. And um, and we had this thought like, are these evilness that, that you must mitigate then? Is it somebody you bring on as, as pure necessity and it's then a constant struggle to, to, to maintain? And, uh, and we've been a little bit worried about that before before, but I think in, in that has totally changed. I think it might have been like that a, a decade ago or more, where uh, there was kind of like a hierarchy between investor and an entrepreneur that I, that I think has matured a lot. And there's a huge focus on being founder friendly and all these things that, have, that has potentially changed that. So it's not been our uh, experience at all so far. And we have a total of four investors. And I would say each one is, is very friendly help some, and overall, uh, a net positive, uh, uh, somebody that provides more value than the the yes questions or something that doesn't provide it. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that that has been our experience. And then finally, here's a quick pros and cons list uh, of what I think has been our experience with uh, with VCs. The negatives, I think, are very minor. Here's, here's one that, that is a negative, but uh, it's not, not a big one. It is. It's like suddenly we have four investors and whenever we need a signature that's board related or something like that, who's, who's like a share owner in the company, we need to hunt down signatures for, for all of them. And that can exponentially prolong those processes, but they're rarely super important or have been yet. It's just it's just basically a little bit annoying as I'm trying to describe here. 
Uh, and then uh, we have one that I would consider either via very minor or neutral, which is the quarterly update, which I, I think is good to be uh, demanded to do because it's kind of like you, you need to stay on top of what you are doing quarterly. And, and it's, it's a bit, a bit of a good quick uh, reflection on how it's going. Uh, but sometimes it can feel a little annoying that you have to fill up these things and you would rather, I don't know, work on your product, for instance. And then uh, not much else so far, but I'm pretty aware that, uh, or from what I hear, conflicts can arise, especially when things go bad. And uh, I don't think we've had uh, any huge conflicts yet, um, or things that has been really bad in our studio since we've gotten uh, investors. And that's where we've not potentially been pressured into a big conflict. I think we had, uh, something that could have been that uh, this year, which is about uh, we are becoming a multi-product uh, company that has several games. And, and as I mentioned before, it's like, um, <clears throat> uh, do you continue on something that's not on subjectivity to, uh, to, for instance, the vision or promise that you're doing? And we have, for instance, a game that, uh, that is keeping us profitable and so on, but has a limited chance of becoming something that generates uh, 100 million annually uh, and so on. But since our ambition level in the culture is very much towards that and aligned with investors, it hasn't been a conflict to, to, to resolve or execute on, on a path that then changes that. Um, so yeah, just ask into that if, if you want more info there. And I'm sure there's lots of bad stories out there, but, uh, but we haven't yet uh, felt it ourselves only purely positives, I would say it's, we're so happy about it overall. Um, uh, I think we benefit positive wise uh, a lot from the sparring that we get access to. You suddenly have somebody that, that potentially cares a lot of, more about your company. Of course, they are invested in it. And uh, the more you spend time with them, the more it becomes an actual caring relation. And I think that's super nice, especially if you're a CEO and sometimes you're in, in, introduced to a conflict or a, a personnel problem or something like that, where it's hard to spar with any of our body about it. And suddenly you have somebody where that might be, be able to relate, especially if they've been operational and have tried it before. And, and it's really nice and uh, can be a stress reliever. Stefan, I just wanted to ask you one thing. Um, on the thing about the risk, um, you kind of covered it, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit uh, how that works. Uh, because I, I know that as investors, and like I said also in the presentation, we we need you to try to go for that small percent chance of uh, like a home run, like a you know really big hit. Uh, you said that we are aligned and so on, and I know we are, but 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 how has this pro that process felt? And and I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more. Do you think you would have done it different if we hadn't been on board, for example? I think we had we had potentially been slower. I think uh, that's part of the things that we benefit a lot from here because we're so auto deduct or whatever you say in uh, in another language. But uh, uh, we're so self taught and and have been creating this uh, company a little bit in a in a notch uh, shell or, or isolated that uh, sometimes we we lack a little bit of perspective. And I think I was a little bit guilty of initially thinking, oh, it's so insane to uh, to have annual revenue of. 5, 10, 25 million or something like that, but it's not really that interesting to a VC. And I don't think it necessarily, because we weren't ambitious, I think we would come to that point at some point, but I think uh, it's just something you can very easily uh, be guilty of if, if, if you don't talk with others uh, and, and get out there. Um, so ambition level wise, I think you could easily find studios that, uh, that and that would be a little, like for instance, we could have been that. We've, we've created a game where we're profitable from it and it's a hard thing to achieve. And suddenly you are kind of like, we have the safety ca uh, carpet that we're on and we are kind of pulling it a little bit away and then going out to, to the more risky thing again. Uh, but since since the culture is, is aiming towards that, we're in the group constantly reassuring ourselves that this is definitely the most exciting thing. And, and when, it, when it comes to that, we would rather uh, dream big and try all these big things rather than, than stay status quo for, forever. And I think it's very much uh, an appetite thing that, that comes down to the culture and, and whoever is in, in the groups should figure out what they're up to in that way. I think we've just talked a lot about it and I, and I think it helps and I think it has pushed a few people away and I, and, the, and I think that's better rather than having it as a silent conflict you never talk about. Okay, thanks. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, another very positive thing is, uh, yeah, the network access. I think I, I, I brought that up, but a way that that uh, is also comes to life is, is uh, getting access to a portfolio family. And, uh, and you always, or you, I guess you kind of feel it a little bit as a family. I think uh, especially LVP and the other investor we have called OneUp is doing a lot of effort to, to create a community out of, of, of the portfolio family and introducing them to in each other and creating a culture of helping uh, and kind of like paying it forward and so on. So we got a lot of help uh, from other Series A racers uh, to give feedback uh, on, on when we were about to do it uh, and we are now trying to do the same. So I think promoting that culture is really nice and you and you, you kind of just get some, some other, for instance, CEO friends or something like that that can relate a ton to all the things that you are you are challenged with, and uh, and I think that's really really nice that that sense of family. Um, then events, yeah, I guess uh, especially LVP is uh, has is creating some of the best ev events uh, conference wise. Uh, that probably one of the best conferences I've ever attended because it's just so uh, so interesting. People that are there that where I've I've encountered some some people and, and, and created some initial friendships that are extremely valuable uh, from this. Uh, so this is one of the biggest uh, outside of the cast positives, I would say there is as well. And then a few perks, stuff like uh, some investors will give you access to app any for free or a discounted price and, and things like that. It's, it's not a huge thing, but, but it's still a perk that, that can be maybe filled on your uh, netline. Then there's board meetings and you could, some people would probably put this on negatives, but I think it has been positive for us. I think the, the amount of time we spend on something that's purely reporting or answering questions for somebody who doesn't really know uh, about it is, is next to zero. I think it, it's, it's a very valuable alignment tool for us. And, and, and I compare it a little bit to, uh, let's say you were losing weight or something like that. And you, you usually do that better if you have like a coach that confronts with you with the the things you want to achieve and tries to support you in doing it. And, and I think it's a little bit related to that um, and becomes your uh, bi-monthly pulse or something like that in the, in the company. So I think it, uh, for us, it's positive. And of course the cash, I think that's positive too. Um, so that was it. And now I think there's uh, the opportunity for questions. And if you, you have follow-ups or something like that, I, I'm pretty good at answering on Twitter and you can, look more stuff up about beta off uh, at these links thank you for listening thank you thank you stefan for like sharing your uh, sh your your experience uh, and maybe like you know uh, just if, before we go to the like the direct discussion like uh, how actually you're working on uh, like in in case of your company yeah? because like you know uh, at a specific point uh, you you're moving from like very very small company very small startup to at least you know more like significant business and so how actually uh, you are dealing uh, with uh, topics like you know increased responsibility uh, you know uh, much more uh, responsibility for like for your company for the people who work uh, uh, for you and you know and what was actually in this in this in this moving from very small startup to, to bigger company, what was actually the most challenging for you? Mm, I guess uh, we're, we're experiencing that a lot right now because we, we did a major scaling this year where uh, December last year we were around 19 people and now we're, we're nearing the, the, the 40s if, if we mm -hmm. count contractors and so on. So I think that challenge has been mainly this year where we're building out, you could say a middle management layer. Uh, and a lot of time goes uh, with aligning on culture and, and putting all sorts of practices and frameworks in to, to, to automate uh, uh, answering of questions such as uh, ensuring we are, we are aligned on vision and, 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 uh, and how we do culture and, and, what's okay, what's not okay, and, and things like that, uh, which I think we are doing well currently, but not necessarily experts in, because it's still pretty new. I mean, it's, of course, we've been used to 19 people uh, for a while, which is bigger than five, but it's come so gradually over the course of seven years or something like that, that it hasn't been a big 
impact, I would say, there's been a lot of time to do it. So it's it's mainly this year now. Stefan, if, if I can ask you one question. Um, what was uh, the biggest difference between uh, your, your seed round and your Series A? Uh, were there any uh, particular things you advise uh, startups to, uh, to look at, uh, to, to, to be, let's say, more aware of? And what, what, what does it look like? Was it much easier? Was it much harder uh, time-wise, effort-wise? What were maybe some of the, the roadblocks you, you've seen on the way? Yeah, I think uh, I think seed was was uh, overall a uh, more complex uh, thing than than Series A, and I don't think I don't know if that's normal. Uh, our seed took much longer and was also impacted by by complex things like uh, there was suddenly a, a potential acquisition offer and all sorts of things to relate to. Uh, and uh, and I think we again this speaks a little bit to us being maybe in a nutshell where we had a, a long uh, pitch round with a Danish investor that of course we felt um, uh, we felt we could trust a lot and and then we made LVP which is, is more like foreign in that context and we were a little we were a little unaware of uh, which I think was positive that uh, that they were a very recognized uh, investor. And I, I think because we weren't too aware, aware of, of that, we, we also weren't, uh, I guess, starstruck or uh, or uh, scared of, of talking with them and so on. It just felt so natural. Uh, and it and our first encounter came from from quite an accident almost. Uh, we di we didn't even plan a meeting, and then we met and were introduced at a conference, and we just uh, talked about whether or not we had scheduled for that next day, and and then it all came from that uh, and I think I was just very uh, inexperienced with this whole process back then and and all that was hugely accelerated uh, towards series A where where it got all the uh, uh, you could say training or, or at least uh, somebody who knew how it was done and I could uh, I could access that knowledge and turn it into into a vehicle and i think that the main advice i'm trying to get now that that people of course uh, has a tendency to ask uh, me if we've done it especially in denmark because not that many do it i think uh, the main takeaway is the is trying to build the story about how you are some sort of vehicle of uh, of uh, what your team is, is able to do what you're doing right now uh, why it fits so well with an opportunity window and uh, and why you're potentially the best team to do it and uh, and then, of course, an exciting uh, vision uh, in that. Um, so, so that it is a bit like building a story. And I think it's extremely hard to not do that. I think it's, it becomes so much easier as soon as, as as the investor or somebody else is is buying into listening to that rather than looking at metrics. For instance, I think metrics has haunted us a lot <laughs> in both the Series A and uh, Seed, because since we had a live operated game, of course people will ask, how, how's that running? And, and it's insanely annoying if you're uh, racing drags out, because then you're you're kind of like, you have to perform at the same uh, kind of initial level that you, you put out. Like like imagine your game is suddenly declining in metrics or something like that, then you're, you're constantly being confronted with finding a reasons to why that is happening. And I think that's, that's just annoying. So my advice is almost like, Avoid showing those data if you can, but there are there are there are situations where you need to do it. I also think that there can be uh, some smart tricks in considering what metrics might sound more impactful uh, than the R to create. And a quick example on that is that I think it benefited us immensely to build up a huge Discord server uh, at a time where everybody was looking at it and evaluating that that is a is is a powerful asset. Uh, or a community growth indicator, uh, where I think it is easier to do that rather than getting uh, uh, in, in stalls uh, in same comparison. Like we would never be able, or it would be pretty hard to get a fifth of Fortnite's install base, but we could get a fifth of Discord uh, users, which just sounds really powerful to put in a slide. Um, and and I think that there can there can be some smart things there. Also. Uh, trying to raise on on a quick uh, growth uh, period like if you had something that grew in the last three months and you then decide to use that data i would i would then put 
very much more emphasis on the FOMO, so you are not uh, asked to defend that uh, three months later when it's declined heavily. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for this. Uh, just to, to take this maybe off, off the table, because there is a, a question, uh, what are the boundaries of, of uh, geographies you are looking at, uh, RM and Harry? Uh, there is a question around India, mm. APAC. Uh, is is there uh, a limit on on uh, where you uh, operate uh, and where you are obviously also effective in, in terms of your teams being closed? So mainly we focus on Europe and North America. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't invest outside. We do have an investment in uh, Latin America. Um, we would not invest for sure in Japan, Korea, China. I've worked for eleven years in. China and uh, almost four years in Japan. And those are local markets where you need to be locally present and so on. And we can't sit in Europe and guide a team in those markets. Um, India, uh, Singapore, Australia. I don't, I think we would struggle to invest in India. I think we would feel like we don't know enough about the ecosystem. We can't help you. We're, we're not on top of the trends. We're too far away. Uh, physically, you will just never feel like fully serviced by us in a way. Um, so I think, I think, yeah, in most cases, we will we will just stick to Europe and North America. And uh, uh, maybe to uh, add the question uh, to again to Harry and Harry, uh, do you? Once you are looking at the projects, do you look differently at the mobile and uh, uh, like yeah. PC console, like gaming tech projects? Do you evaluate them differently? What is your view on that? Yeah, very much so. Um, I think it links to what I talked about earlier that you look at each platform and each type of opportunity differently over time. So, uh, Mobile teams, you know, since the App Store started, there's been an evolution in what we think is required to start a good mobile company. So early on, maybe two guys, mainly strong on product, uh, no knowledge maybe on, on, on monetization, just an interest would be enough. No marketing guy on the team, no finance guy on the team. That was probably enough. And the team would go out and they would spend, you know, 200K, get something to market, learn from it, uh, iterate, right? But over time, as that market matures and, and you need to start doing UA, you need to have this marketing guy on your team. And then, you know, the competition gets fiercer and the margins get, get smaller and you need to have a monetization guy on the team from the beginning so that you really know that you can build a good, monet good enough monetization into your games. And then the novelty of investing in mobile games sort of went away a little bit and it starts being more difficult to raise series A. So then we think, okay, you need a, one of the guys at least has to cover the financial side, be, you know, meaning that he's able to build a good pitch, good story for series A, deliver it, work with investors to get them excited. So over time, typically, you know, the requirements stack as the budgets go up and the competition goes up and the maturity goes up and the, and the platform growth tailors off and the time to peak on games comes down. Um, so uh, that's a difference. And I think on mobile today, it, it, so speaking very, very generalized, like uh, if you're in hyper casual, you're a game guy, probably not so interested to talk to you. Hypercasual is not about the game. It's not the love of the game. It's about marketing. You need to be like all in for marketing. That's your passion. Uh, it's almost like you you need to think. Unfortunately, I have to make these games to get ads in front of people. And the second I find an easier way to get an ad in front of someone, I will stop making games. And I don't mean it in a derogatory way. For for a lot of people, this is an exercise that they enjoy. This is the way for them to disconnect and do a little thing. And a lot of those people get turned off by big games where you have where there are very gamey and lingo and so on. So anyway, so you so that requires a certain type of team. If you're going mid core, you know I I need to know that you really know your metrics, that you really know all the technicalities of how to build economies in those those type of games. And so on and so on and so on. Otherwise, you're not going to be competing. And you know, so for each segment, it, it's like a set of, of knowledge and things that needs to be covered by, by a team member. Uh, PC is less technical. You know, there's less focus on that, that um, transactional 
uh, LTV UA formula. There's it's typically yet less UA margin driven. Uh, there's room for more design patterns. There's you know there's not like a few limited ways of building an economy that leads to sufficient LTV. Uh, and it's also driving innovation on hardcore games and core you know core games and so on. So different set of questions where you need to have look at different other things. But typically it's bigger budget, bigger teams, right? And you need a skill of being able to manage a team better, manage the dev cycles, and so on, right? And then speaking for on the gaming tech side, I think it's a, a little bit different. Maybe it's somewhat similar if you've got a more consumer facing platform or, or, or tech solution mm -hmm. um, like bunch within our portfolio that that will be more similar to say a, a mobile investment in looking at the the metrics that they're building as well as actually some pc uh, side where it's more about building the community early on and getting feedback from them um, it, it, in order to generate those network effects but then on uh, the B2B side, uh, I think it's well known the difference between B2B and B2C, more predictable with B2B, you need to look at the addressable market, the, um, the pipeline of potential customers and users of this. Uh, and then also within gaming it, itself, it's understanding, okay, you've got a, or you're solving a large problem, and you've got this great solution. How are you monetizing it? Because even with Unity from the S1, uh, the way that they're monetizing isn't through selling the engine itself. It's the entire ecosystem. It's the their operate solutions, which generate 60% of their revenue. So it's understanding also execution and commercialization um, on the on the tech side, and then also uh, within game itself. Even though it's a it's a massive market, it's 160, 170 billion odd estimated for this year. That gaming is fairly concentrated on the on the supply side, on the on the business side. Uh, so can you can you own that market? Can you get a high penetration rate within that? Um, and then a, a, a related question to that is: uh, Can it apply to other markets? Uh, can you use this? And this is what is increasingly happening with uh, with Unity and Unreal that they're being applied to other markets, and that almost de-risks it in the in the mind of an investor, saying, "Okay, you've got this this captive art market in in gaming, uh, but then you can can spread, you can uh, land and spread within other markets once you've honed it within the gaming sector." And that was a, a case in point for our investment into Hedion where game companies are fairly experimental and they're able to use their technology um, in order to prove out some things. And they're now using it for life sciences, for COVID tracking, uh, for, for defense. So uh, I, I think there are different ways of looking at the, the different segments of the market. Uh, with another question, maybe uh, uh, both of you, Steph, uh, and also Harry and Are. Uh, I'll start maybe with the second part of the question. How how long and how willing uh, is an investor willing to, to wait for, for profitability, for, for good uh, results? So that would be the, the first question. How how patient uh, are, are you guys? And in general, what's your experience? And the second one, uh, you, you touched upon a bit on, on the marketing uh, uh, related topics. So... Uh, What's a good marketing budget and retention metric? Uh, so I assume you're we're talking here uh, uh, about a specific genre or, or, or maybe in general. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to answer uh, in general um, because I, I think on certain platforms, you have to accept that it's a bit of a grind. You know, you don't, any longer launch a game and then have you know massive amounts of users and massive amount of profitability you know many genres right now it's changed to where it's kind of slow community building getting the word out adding things uh, you know you should in many areas you should release quite early and so on um, so I think we are super willing to wait I think if it relates back to me talking about killing things earlier I think it's when the metrics are so clearly not there, um, when you're clearly so far away from where you should be at the current stage, 
that you need to be very realistic about do I have a plan that will bridge where I am to where I need to go or am I just working for the sake of not wanting to you know uh, take the pain and realize that that we failed on something if you are within range of something reasonable for where you should be at that stage you know if it's early access or whatever or and and you can show traction and so on you know yeah you know you should probably continue to uh, to work on it um yeah I, I don't know harry if if uh on, on the marketing budget i mean most times you you know the marketing budget is is a performance marketing based i don't think that that startups should spend much money on brand marketing which means you know unmeasured marketing where you don't measure the return uh, i think that's something you leave for the very large guys or after you are very successful so the uh, the budget that a good budget should be the budget that you can invest on a reasonable horizon um, with your ROI target. And I think your ROI target, so your return on investment on marketing spend should be very low when you are a startup. Uh, I read this like simple thing the other day as an American investor that said that uh, as an investor, you have to be willing to um, uh, switch. So in, in the very beginning of a startup, the investor's role on the board is to focus on profitability. So you should focus, focus, focus on finding that product that has unit economics that are positive, and you should be fighting growth, meaning that you should be preventing and trying to, to, to resist and making sure that founder does not go out and scale the team, you know, buy tons of users or do other things that grow the business, but he, he should search desperately and urgently for profitability, which means, you know, finding that game that, that you can validate, that it resonates, that it has the right retention, so the LTV is high enough that you could run this as a business. That's your objective. But then the second you've done that, the second you've found that, a good investor should switch his mind, and now he should be focused purely on growth and not on profitability. So you should not be focused on like how much money are you making now, but you should be focused on you know how can you uh, grow this business to be very very large. Uh, of course, it's a little bit different in game investment. That speaks more to typical tech investments where the two phases are very defined and the product might live forever. And you know launching a game might be different. You might need to go out with a bang and big marketing campaign to have a chance. So anyway, but but I think that's kind of the mindset. So we should. Um, you should spend the marketing budget that gives you a slightly positive ROI, but you should probably maximize growth in the beginning. Thank you very much for this. So one more uh, thing which which uh, we, uh, as in uh, Google and Marius and myself, uh, uh, meet pretty often is uh, the question around uh, publishing versus investing. Uh, are there, from your point of view, any scenarios uh, when uh, the, let's say, the investor option is much better than than just uh, going with with publishing? Yeah, I think in 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 the, I have to say in the majority of cases that I see, um, if you don't have any investment into your business, so if you're completely independent company and you go out and you try to fund your development through publisher deals, then the terms you get are not really good. So by that, I mean that you end up best case giving away such a large portion of your potential future revenue that in most cases, when you release that game, you will not be building enough capital to be able to self finance uh, your next game. So you become captive, you know, and you will need to do something later. So your option next will be redo another publishing agreement to get enough money in to do the next game or go out and fundraise. But now based on a story of a previous game, which can be good and can be bad. Um, and then even worse is that very many game founders are more from the game side and less from the business side. And they get a little bit exploited often. So we often see terms where they give up the IP, uh, they give perpetual rights, even if the publisher ends up not really doing anything with it. Uh, things like that, which are just detrimental to your ability to build value in your business. Um, so I mean, from, from, from a 
pure economic point of view, if you make a game with VC money and you make revenue of X, then the value of your business is, you know, a number times that X, and then you can more or, or more detailed, you can subtract your cost and you see what kind of profit you have. And then it's like, you know, time 20 or whatever at the moment, maybe more. Uh, that's the value of your business and you would be able to sell a portion of your business for that. Um, but then, you know, so, so a, a publishing contract removes a lot of potential upside. Mm. And just to expand upon that, I, I think it's useful to talk about the differing motivations that investors tend to invest into the underlying company rather than an individual project and therefore investors enable that creative freedom and experimentation across different games without the product milestones and revenue share deals that, that publishers will put in place. We don't want your IP. We want you to grow and grow with us to, um, I mean, what, what we target is at least um, uh, 10x our investment, but we're wanting the $500 million, billion dollar businesses. And with VC money, I think it enables teams to achieve that, giving you time, years of runway and time to prototype. Um, uh, but then, then again, it's not a dichotomy. You can put VC money in and you can get a publisher, particularly if you're wanting to enter certain geographies like China. Um, it can, with VC money, as, as Ari was saying, enable you to get better terms from them, uh, especially if CPIs are quite high and you're wanting for, to look for some, some cheaper ways of, of getting money quickly in order to spend on your game. Um, it, it, it depends, as, as with everything, on the, on the company that you're wanting to build. Thank you. Uh, my first gaming business was an outsourced business where I developed games on contract for EA and Glue Mobile. And uh, at least to me, it became clear very quickly that my job was to make sure that the producer on the EA side felt that I had delivered what he wanted me to deliver. Because if the game failed, I expected that he would look back on it like, shit, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have pushed for the co-op feature. You know, it didn't pay off, you know, but 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 he will also think about it like, but at least, you know, R and his team delivered. But if I, I always felt that if I took like massive creative risk and I, I pushed back on him and I said, no, 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 we got to go this way. We got to do this thing. And the game fails. Then I've lost uh, EA as a source of future business because they will think of me like, wow, look, you know, they idiots you know they pushed the game this direction predictably now it fails you know it wasn't our fault right so so you realize that like, what business are you in and it's a similar consultancy you know you if you're a consultant then you know your job is to retain your customers and get them to keep paying you money not to tell them the harsh truth if that ruins your business with them right so uh, so that's why i i think vcs and and at least me personally very often when i talk to work as a higher studios that want to now get VC investment to make their game, I always have this skepticism of what organization have you been building over the last, you know, X many years when you've been doing work for hire? Do you really have those people on the team that have creative inspiration and drive and motivation? Or have you built an organization that is a sales organization that is tuned to operating on instruction, you know, handling incoming requests and blah, 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 right? It's, a, it's, it's two very different things to build. Thank you. And maybe now actually now the question to Stefan, because there is the, like you mentioned uh, quite a lot about building community and actually that's quite important part of, of, of your company as well. There's the question that uh, uh, like being very community focused uh, uh, is important part of your game development. How does your community align or conflict with your vision? How do how do you balance that? Oh, that's a that's a deep uh, topic. I think uh, the key answer would be honesty. And then, uh, I mean, a, a quick uh, example recently is that uh, we we weren't too satisfied with uh, the the income generated from the, our game minion masters, and so we we told the community that. Uh, in a very honest way and said that we are going to uh, tune some things in the game now that will that will that is an effort to increase the revenue but should still uh, stay true with our vision of making it really funny if you don't spend money and i think uh, it created a lot of uh, 
uh, thing, I mean, uh, replies where people were really angry about it. On a, and then we measured whether, for instance, our long-term players would drop and so on. But we also saw uh, one of our biggest threats ever in the community uh, where people gathered around and, and pitched ideas for how to tune up the revenue. So I think, um, I think that's important because you want them to align with you. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's a problem if you're trying to always make them 100% happy because you are ending up with some commitments that I think will lead to conflict uh, at some point. So I think it is a little bit almost like a, uh, like a culture in a company that you need to breed a, the culture you want long term and then uh, have a massive amount of vocal evangelists in the community that then are, are aligned with that and, and breeds that uh, community uh, or that um, communication into the community as well. So it, it doesn't only come from, from the developers, it also comes from, you could consider it the idols in, in the Discord server or uh, wherever you, you build your community. Thank you. Uh, and maybe then, like, you know, following uh, the question to Ara and, and, and Harry, uh, how long does it take to take investment process from selecting a VC to, like, being approved and, like, getting real cash? What's the time frame? Uh, like, does it take, like, you know, years, months, weeks? It's a huge range. Um... The fastest decision that we have made as a team as in the time I have been there has been that I met the team in the evening on Thursday. Then we had a call, all of us, with the team on Friday morning. And after the call, we decided to make it uh, an investment. And then after that, it was um, two weeks or three weeks with the term sheet because it was an American team. They had a quite tricky lawyer that was pushing back on lots of stuff. So it took uh, a week more than normal. And then the long form documents took uh, I forget, but I would I would think like four weeks, something like that. The long form documents are quite big. Um, and then the longest one, I think it's with me and Stefan um, because I really it was my first investment to push, so I wasn't having a lot of um, confidence in a way, you know and and um, Stefan's team was so unusual it was so indie it was so different and i just felt like this is something that we really should back but it took me a while to sort of build the argumentation and the points and so on and and it was also very much based on like being so intrigued by stefan and the team and then observing them over the next few months i was just like wow you know like the, the speed of learning is just crazy um and stefan at the time had a pitch that was awful and uh, my team was asking me like why why are you spending time on this you know like that pitch is awful you know like look they're gonna make like 14 games in the next three years and so on and i told my team okay i will not talk to them now for a month but uh if i'm correct then in a month or two stefan will come back to us with a new plan that has probably two games instead of 14. and they were like yeah whatever you know how would you know that and then two months later, Stefan pinged us, and he had implemented the met metrics-driven uh, operation, and he had trimmed his uh, release plan down from 14 to two games. So it was like it was just like that. So it was a very like interesting process, but unique, I think, because I was lacking the experience, you know, to quickly trust my gut feeling and so on and so on. Right? And I think a lot of VC situations will be like that. You have to think about who are you talking to. Did they recently raise money so they feel like really rich and they feel they have like an you know, endless amount of capital to deploy? Or is it at the end of the fund where they're kind of freaking out a little bit because they don't know if they have made the right investments and they only have two more investments to make? Or, you know, are you talking to a guy with a lot of experience who makes quick, quick decisions? Or are you talking to a young guy who will need lots of data to dare to propose that his firm should do this, you know? So, so those things also impact the timeline a lot. And just to clarify on some of the, the terms that Ara is talking about, term sheet um, that outlines the heads of terms for investment from a VC or an investor. So how the round will operate, what kind of rights are assigned to the investment that you put into this company. And that's usually non-legally binding. And then uh, once that is signed, you go through that process of creating the long form documents, which refer to the company documents that establish actually how the company will operate, 
um, and go through all of the legalese um, compared to say a term sheet which is in plain English of how this would how this would function. Uh, and then once those are all signed, there's also a difference between closing and wiring. You should, well, sometimes you can do it on the same day. Other countries, it can take a bit longer in order to uh, establish the account or you've got other processes or bureaucracies that you've got to manage. So it can cap take a bit longer to wire the money into your account um, following the, the closing. But uh, yeah, that, that's just in, in case anybody didn't didn't know the terminology and i recommend reading uh ahead of doing any negotiations venture deals by i think it's brad Feldon, um jason mendelson uh it's a it's a it's a great book 20 quid i think it will save you potentially thousands oh and there's ra with <laughs> with the cover um if you think about raising vc it's the best book to read thank you Thank you very much, uh, Harry. And while you are at it, uh, if you don't mind uh, telling us a bit uh, on uh, a bit more uh, on on how you evaluate financial provisions from early uh, seed startups uh, when when there is not yet enough data available to, to be very uh, accurate. And by financial provisions, does this mean uh, uh, how we value the companies or? This is this is my assumption. Yes, yeah. so I, I would assume it's a it's a rather uh, back end question to to, to to you guys. How yeah. how you uh, answer this uh, this uh, uncertainty? Yeah, I so I will answer it like based on how we we would set the valuation of a company based on limited amount of data and so on, right? So uh, and and many of the companies we invest in, like I said, don't have any data. It's not even like a, a legal entity yet you know it has to be formed before we can make the a conclude the investment so there's nothing to base it on um and i think it's um it's based part on tradition and history and um and demand um and demand is not just demand for a team but it's also sector specific um and the tradition, so in, 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 in tradition, uh, tradition is that a startup with two, three guys and, and a great idea is worth two to six million. And, you know, there is a technical way to think about it because the way you would think about it is that they, they have, the founders are putting something into the company. They're putting their knowledge, they're putting their energy and, the, and, and their foregoing salaries. So they probably will have a salary, but it's probably well below market so you know you can kind of think about it as they're making a commitment for x number of years and they're going to have reduced salary and they're putting in this you know extreme motivation and drive to build this business and then the investors are matching that somehow and paying a bit of a premium uh, to put money into the business and then you get to something like three to six million um but it's really just done like that it's really like a finger in the air it's like you know, how, how much is this worth? Uh, it also depends on what you are raising for. So if your plan requires um, very little money to get to the first point where you can make like a really informed decision of if it's working or not, let's say you need just 250,000, then typically your price of the company will also reduce a bit because the investors simply don't want to give you money if the stake that they get back is you know 0.1 of a percent it just doesn't make any sense because the value of your business would have to be so high for that to be worth anything that it just doesn't make any sense to spend time on it so an investor is typically looking for like 10 to 20 percent of your business so that they feel like okay now i can spend time on you and supporting you and having meetings with you and introduce you to my network and so on. so somewhere there you you're sort of meeting in, in all those traditions with what you're asking for, the stake that they want, and so on. And it sort of balances out. So actually, when you start asking for more money, when you ask for like 2 million, and typically it will also lead to your company being valued higher automatically, simply by the fact that you're asking for 2 million. So if you're capable of demanding that raise and getting people to feel like, yeah, this guy is good enough and his other guy is good enough and, and you know, the, the, and, and, uh, uh, you know, they're going to get something together and I believe in this and, you know, I will definitely 
support them with two million, it will drive up the price of that business because the investors will be thinking, uh, we want a stake of this business, but we don't want to take a too big stake because when we are going to go out with the founders and raise the next round, the Series A, we know that the Series A investors will look at the capitalization table, uh, you know, the, the 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 ownership of the business, and the series, the good Series A investors, they will want to make sure that after they buy into the business, the founders and the employees still control around 50% or more of the business. So, uh, you know, a bad investor will sort of try to grab a big piece of your business for no money early on, thinking that he's smart. But what he's actually doing is that he's burning bridges to get good investors to come in later. So it's it's all those things uh, put together that sort of sets where um, where the valuation is. Uh, and then it's sector specific. So at certain points in time, for example, hypercasual was super hype for a while. And investors had a sense that if you had a really good team doing hyper cash flow, they would only raise money once. And then they would be cash flow positive from the second month and they would never raise again. So it was the only point in time where you could give money and buy a stake in the company was at the seed round. And that drove up the valuation. And because there were a limited number of teams that had the right background, like this marketing background that I talked about, there was intense competition for the teams and because people were willing to think of it as it's not really a series a seed it's kind of like a series a because this company will only raise one round so that led to like lots of these companies being uh, raising money on like 16 to 20 million dollars and that happens again and again for different reasons what's that answer and thank you and, and then actually building on that uh uh, because you you touched a little bit that uh, in the next question there is like the question like interactive fiction text RPG uh, game for mobile and platform for writers uh, like you no know, uh, like you no know, uh, can be like the niche to be to kind of big enough for for VC or like you no know, VC is just looking for really you know big uh, big things or like you know what is what is your review on that. I really loved yeah. uh, your your story with uh, with meeting uh, the the company on 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 Monday. Oh, you're me? No, but can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I really enjoyed the, your story with with meeting the the company on on Monday and closing the deal on Friday. And I see Martin here has uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, which Marius mentioned on on the genre, if 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 there is something like uh, a two niche product, uh, and and uh, the second one, uh, uh, I, I would really love for us to to have a similar uh, success story with you guys. So meeting the company on on, on a game camp uh, webinar on. Uh, Thursday and and closing the deal maybe after the weekend. So, <laughs> uh, I, I'll I'll take the the first question. Um, the answer is no, because we actually have an example of that within our portfolio called Dorian. Um, they're a UGC platform for interactive fiction for writers on, on mobile. Uh, and I think there's a there's a quote from Peter Thiel. Regardless of what you think about his political leanings or or personal, he's a he's a very intelligent, um, very good investor. And he was talking about, I don't care about big markets. What I care about is a monopoly of a niche market that can then be used to expand into other markets. Because uh, more often than not, where people who pitch fall down, and I think this is regardless of sector, you ask them, who is this for? Who's the user? And the worst answer that you can give is everyone. Because uh, how do you reach everyone? Who are you? What, what are you looking to solve? Uh, what channels are you using for distribution? Um, and I, I think that's very problematic. Um, and I, again, this goes back to a bit about the the tech and the B two B side for for games that uh, you solve a niche problem and then you monetize it and commercialize around that. That you have this fixed. Uh, beachhead within there, and then once you've got this user base, you're then able to to monetize on top of that. Uh, 
Thank you for, very much for that. Uh, and I think we, we have the, the last question. That's why I, I mentioned this uh, success story with GameCam. So uh, Marcin is asking, uh, from a team perspective, uh, how, how does a setup like a solo developer plus freelance uh, uh, ad hoc uh, development sound like? Uh, although, let's say, uh, assuming that uh, as, a, as a solo developer, you, you can uh, drag this, this whole project to, to land. How, is this something which, which might be interesting for, uh, for a, a VC? I, I I don't know enough about it to really say. It depends very much. I, I would say that at the high level, it sounds like it has certain uh, problematic things that would need to be bridged because we invest in the company and the team more than a project. Um, it's almost like, you know, we have been making games for a long time. So we think that your game is likely to fail your first game will fail very likely or not do very good and it's the value that we are interested in is the team and the lessons and that over time as a team and as as working towards building a new type of game for a new type of audience in a new genre maybe on some new tech you learn how to do it so retaining that and building that over time and, and building that knowledge in a group of people that stay relatively stable is really the key to how we invest. Um, so investing in something that sounds more like a single project where it's really a solo person and a lot of freelance has that weakness that you're not investing in knowledge into a team. Uh, but of course, there are lots of models. So it, it depends on a lot of detail of, of what the specific cases and opportunity is and so on. Yeah, just following up on that, I think Mediatonic have done a lot of work for hire stuff, and then they came out with Fall Guys, and they accepted some VC money. So I think it can work, but it's just about getting your priorities straight and being able to phase in and phase out a production that you're able to almost uh, dog food the, the work for hire stuff and any projects that you've got on the side so that it doesn't get in the way of your higher ROI original IP work. Um, so I've at least from what I've seen, it's quite hard to, uh, once you've got into the habit of work for hire, and this again goes to Ari's point about creative expression and freedom and taking those risks, but then also a reliance on stability. And again, VC money isn't for everyone. If you want a, a nice, stable lifestyle business, you can do work for hire and maybe you, you, you get 500K, a million um, out of a, a successful project, more than that. But with VC money, we're looking for far beyond that, uh, those moonshot ideas that will return 500 million, a billion in lifetime revenue. I see. Thank you guys really for like, you know, um, like this amazing session that was, I think it was very, very interesting for, for everyone, like a lot of learnings, a lot of uh, sharing. So I really, you know, uh, together with Norbert, we really would like, you know, to thank you for your time spent, spent on that. Uh, so, uh, of course, to like you know, all our uh, uh, people who like listen to us, you know, please visit our uh, Game Camp website. There will be like another sessions in the future. Uh, I really encourage you, everyone who is thinking about uh, uh, investment, to reach out to Aaron and Harry. I will be. I'm pretty sure they will be happy to you know to talk to everyone. Uh, we, we talk that it's like it's good to talk about those things as, as early as possible. So I would really use the opportunity and reach out to them uh, after uh, after the session. With that, thank you again, guys. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having Thanks, us. everyone. Have a good day and, of course, happy 2021. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.